Hi, Adam here. Good to see you. Uh, yesterday, I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the Reba Innovation Day. Just realised that shows backwards, so not so helpful. Uh, it's their fifth um, annual conference, and um, I'll be honest, Reba, the Reward and Employee Benefits Association, interesting thing for me. They've been uh, obviously going for at least five years, with this being their fifth conference, and they're one of those organisations that have been creeping into my consciousness. So they've been increasingly pervasive. Uh, I was aware of Debbie Donovan, one of the co-founders from um, her work previously. And just increasingly, I was seeing great content with them. So when the opportunity came to uh, actually come and join and participate, uh, I was very, very keen to, uh, to come along. And I made various notes from the day. I saw a few interesting suppliers and I just wanted to uh, have a little chat with you uh, about those. Conference kicked off uh, with Matthew Taylor. He did the Taylor report for uh, the government a couple of years ago on what good work looks like. And yeah, I mean, a, a very good speaker, uh, very engaging and uh, a few interesting bits that I put out. I mean, first of all, just, you know, sort of thrown in there. Um, half of the people who are in poverty are actually in work, uh, which for me was... It was one of those things. You're kind of generally aware that working people can be in poverty, but the fact that actually half are, you know, how how can we be employing people and they're still in poverty? So as a reward professional, um, you know, like, okay, is an organisation paying poverty wages? Are we contributing to this? Um, a lot about technology, uh, I mean, the focus, Innovation Day, how is the digital transition, how is technology going to transform work? And he posed a very uh, interesting question and, and basic uh, question, which is, if we are asking um, how is technology going to change us, uh, kind of we've already lost, we're asking the wrong question. Technology should be in service to us. So how can we use technology to achieve our aims rather than actually, you know, how is technology going to do it? Technology is our servant, our tool, not our master. And he um, and raised some points from his own research where just actually when he talks to, to general people um, about technology, there's a lot of concern that it will deteriorate the quality of their jobs, that there'll be increased surveillance of them. Um, and people are extremely comfortable about automated decision making. So things without a human involved, they want to know that there's a human who's part of this, who's participating in it. But he was very positive. He was making the case that actually technology can be very much a driver um, to help us devolve power on autonomy. So what people want is they want autonomy. They want to be able to determine their path at work. They have um, control over their work. They want to feel connectedness, to be part of a team, part of a community that they're doing. And they want uh, mastery, so the opportunity to be as good as you can be in a role. And if we look at technology and we are basing our systems and our processes on how we can make sure that these are doing the right things for people, given the chance that they can empower these things and actually bring our people closer together to free them up um, from sort of, you know, tight control to uh, to be able to run their, their positions, to give them trust and power, that actually we can make sure that we are very much keeping the human involved and in the loop. And uh, in the report, he cited some work from Charlie Ledbetter that I wasn't aware of. Uh, I will make sure to go and check out this, uh, this summary that he did investigating into innovative organisations. And he had a, a sort of catchphrase that came out of it at the end, which was that all of these organisations, so places like Apple, like um, Pixar uh, and other non-technology examples, but he was uh, this Indian community that was uh, getting thousands of kids into education. They were all creative communities with a cause. So the three C's, nice and catchy. He made that point, you know, who doesn't love a little bit of alliteration? Um, but yeah, creative communities with a cause. So people who are empowered, who are part of a group and they have a distinct vision. 
And as if by magic or extremely careful planning by uh, Debbie and the team, um, followed on we had uh, Evelyn Doyle from Patagonia. Uh, again, uh, you know, I'll hold my hand up, an organisation I'd not heard of, but very much one founded on a cause. So they are ostensibly a retailer, they are a for-profit organisation, but they are also an activist organisation. So um, they are built around the principle of doing the least harm uh, to the planet and actually fighting for causes. Um, I mean, just as a very general example, they actually have a bail policy. So if their staff are arrested, while protesting for an environmental cause, then the company will assist them and come and help bail them out, which is just immediately a massive connection to cause. So we are here, we are protecting the planet, we are fighting for the planet, we are making sure that everything that we do is to assist, we are encouraging you to be yourself and to fight for these causes if that's what you believe in, and they are backing it up with actions. Um, the organization pays 1% of its uh, sales as a, um, I don't have the quite right term, as a green tax, I think, or as a, a planet tax, sort of reflecting its uh, impact on the world. And they're putting that towards good causes. And it really stood out for me. And it's an example of just another company where you've got these people right from the very top of the organization who are driving this philosophy and they are saying we believe in this and we back it we back it completely because this is the type of organization we want to be and she said realistically they miss out on business they've turned down um, sales opportunities with organizations because they don't think that those organizations match up to their own ideals and really it was just fantastic to hear directly of this creative community with a cause and through the other sessions, um, very much with focus uh, was that actually, um, that's something I made a note from later, I mean, reward cannot be about simply paying people or about offering a benefits package. Um, the world is very much changing and People have always wanted to know that they're making a, a, a contribution to something. But the thing is, with this increased kind of connected world with technology, it's becoming very obvious if you are part of that kind of organisation. Um, if your organisation uh, is not making a positive impact, if it's not got its social agenda and its um, you know community responsibilities if it's not participating in society and it's not something you can be proud of then people can tell um so various interesting things i mean i'm not going to go into everyone that i saw but a few things uh, just eat made a very important case about belonging so uh, this is more in kind of like the mental health um, agenda but I really like the idea that belonging is feeling that you are in a safe space where you can share both your joys and your woes. So in your family at home, um, if you have a nice happy family uh, environment, you should be able to come home and say to people, wow, you know, something brilliant happened. Or you should be able to say, oh, today's been really tough. You can open yourself emotionally and that should be possible at work. Um, I'm not saying that we, you know, all need to be constantly sharing uh, cry, shoulders to cry on or sort of, you know, sharing everything that's within us. But the thing is, if you're going to be your best, you should be able to show your best. You should be able to show what's inside and share your joys and share your woes and expect to have support for those and enthusiasm because this is where you belong. This is part of who you are and you're in a community. You have that connectedness. Touching a little bit there on the well-being agenda and uh, Willis Towers Watson, they were giving some insight from their um, benefit survey, 4,000 employers around the, uh, the world, various different sizes, a lot of people covered in it. Um, when they were talking about it, they were making the point that actually well-being 
as an agenda is starting to kind of take on a bit of a shape. It's not really quite um, a wishy-washy term that's not so well determined. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about well-being, they were making the case about four pillars. So the physical, uh, obviously, you know, health, private medical, uh, that's been all in, in place for some time. That's uh, the big one that we all know about. Um, they said emotional, but sort of the, the mental health well-being, obviously there used to be employee uh, assistance programs, they're still there, of course. Um, and, you know, we now have mental health first aiders, we have the time to change pledge, we have a lot of work where people are, you know, raising the visibility of it and being free to talk about their mental health issues uh, in the work environment. Uh, people that have worked with me know that I will be very open about my own struggles, just trying to participate and say, yes, we can talk about this. They made the point about financial. Uh, again, one that's been sort of, you know, known and sort of tacked on as financial education, but, you know, yeah, people are stressed. Um, you know, go back to half of the people who are in poverty are in work. How can we support people, um, not just with their pay, but also in terms of trying to help them manage their pay or have access to things if uh, they have unexpected bills or things are tight. They tax on a fourth one, which I meant to go and try and pin them down on. They were making the point about social well-being. And they said that this one was kind of like the least well-determined out of the bunch. And yeah, they didn't give any particular examples. They had a relatively short span of time. I'm sure they would have gone into more detail if they could. Um, so that one's kind of a bit open for interpretation. I'm kind of a bit open. Is this the connectedness? Is this making sure that people are part of a, an overall team? Is it being there to help them with family issues? I'm interested into how it differentiates from emotional. Um, certainly in my case, uh, my social interactions would be very much about the emotional. So I'm waiting for a bit of definition there. In a later presentation from Capita, um, actually they raised kind of like a, a fifth well-being column, which did resonate, um, which was career. So your career well-being. And the reason it struck with me is that when I talk about performance management and what a good performance conversation should be, actually, you know, it's kind of, yeah, you know, your performance catch-ups, they shouldn't be about your day-to-day. -day. Um, actually, they should be looking longer term and they should cover the well-being agenda. You know, you don't have to go into detail, like, you know, tell me exactly how you're feeling or everything, but you should be touching on and, you know, just as, uh, you know, nothing should be surprised in an end of year review if someone is, uh, goes off stress, you shouldn't be shocked that you never saw the signs. Um, and actually in those conversations as well, you want to be talking about career, you want to be talking about developing people. So almost in terms of the agenda of looking after someone's well-being in the workplace, career is right up there, uh, as is physical, emotional, financial and social, because those all help you be your best in the work environment. Uh, be remiss if I didn't throw out a little uh, shout out to Deborah Frost, CEO of Personal Group and the founder of my old uh, consulting firm, Inecto Award Consulting, um, <coughs> talking about making sure that we are humanizing um, the technology experience. So uh, to try and distill the point, um, essentially we have access to a lot of data analytics and it's very much sort of transforming the HR uh, experience. So, you know, go back five years and uh, I was with Deborah and we're doing a presentation about analytics and the, the fact that it can empower an HR organisation. Empowers the HR team so that when they uh, go uh, to the executive team or they go out to departments and directors and they talk to people, we have the power to really provide evidence now to sort of say, look, this is what the data shows. And... That's great. It's sort of transforming us from, um, you know, oh, this is what we feel or this is what we believe into, you know, more of a harder data um, side. So look, this is what we can show. But really it felt like the warning was, don't take that too far. You know, like we've, we've come from here, we've come to here. Oh, well, let's make sure we stay in the middle somewhat. So don't forget that all of your data is ultimately about human beings, that these are ultimately human stories. And I made a note 
Um, remember that human stories are your employees' experience and think how do they match up with your company's story or vision. So if you've got data that shows something, that's great, but never look at it coldly. Never just go, oh, the numbers say this, so we'll go off and do that. Remember that we've got the human beings involved and that actually, yeah, make sh you have to look at it with uh, interpretation. You have to make sure that you're not going off into a coldly logical uh, space that actually doesn't suit your people. Uh, following uh, Deborah was Capita. Uh, who did the most amazing presentation. He said he had 45 minutes of material and 20 minutes, I believe him. Uh, but he crammed a huge amount in uh, very legibly and it was a highly enjoyable session. Um, the core of it was in some ways a distressing message. He was saying that digitization, so a fully optimized digital environment, so that online experience and the good tools is really kind of already here. Or rather, the sort of the view is that it's going to be here in five years. But the thing is, if you want to be ready in five years, you have to be working on this now. So if you're not doing something in the next six to 12 months, like you're not getting underway, you're kind of already behind the curve. And actually, uh, seeing all the great providers in the session, hearing about all the things that can be done and then thinking about various offline, non-digital uh, processes that are in place at places I've worked, that rang a bell. Um, actually, yes, these tools are there. They're going to become the norm. And if you've got people working in organizations without these tools, then it's, you know, are you going to get left behind by technology? Um, one piece of this which personally resonated is talking about how with technology we avoid loneliness and lack of support. So again, people that work with me know I don't like to work from home. I uh, just sort of mentally need the people around me or I sort of need that space where I'm working and I feel the people around me. Even if I've got headphones in, and I'm sort of internally in my space, I like to know that I've got other colleagues around me. It's sort of part of who I am. And the risk that with um, technology, sort of increased remote working, or kind of just how we make sure that we don't raise up physical barriers as we break down the technological barriers. So we can bring people together, but actually just make sure that we are keeping people connected. So for an example, if I was working constantly from home, uh, but connected in with a remote team that I see on Skype, but I never talk to, oh, you know, I, I would not be a child of the future in that environment. So an interesting one, as I say, that resonated with me. Towards the end of the day, we had um, the final plenary sessions, uh, starting off with sort of a, a joint speaker panel, so for questions, Conica, Mil uh, sorry, Conica Minolto, Jaguar, Land Rover, Skyscanner, and the Wellcome Trust. So very interesting just to hear from them and um, their experiences. Uh, actually very much sort of trying to transform um, older packages uh, for the established organizations or grow with the expectations of the younger crowd. And there was a lot about um, transparency, about practices, helping people understand what they do. Uh, and also making sure that you're actually meeting the real needs of your people. So making sure you survey them and get feedback. Um, and some of the changes. So an interesting one, Jaguar Land Rover, saying that um, actually see increasing requests to put parents on private medical insurance. So that uh, concept of sort of how is the family evolving? How is it changing? Um, uh, the concept of the family is changing and evolving in modern times and how can our benefits change to meet them. Nice little question at the end um, about engaging with offline employees. Again, my experience is largely office based, but, you know, I've worked with organisations with retail uh, with retail uh, stores and you have that immediate problem. Sort of like, OK, there's a computer, 
you know, there's a terminal in the store, but it's for everybody. Like anyone can log on to it and sort of access their things, but it's not at the core of what they do. And suddenly your digital messaging, your emails out to people, your um, things on the internet are not as accessible. So how do you try and reach those people if they're on a manufacturing line, if they're in the retail stores, if they're out in the field? And uh, one interesting thing with Jaguar, I know we're just saying that actually for that purpose, um, they had uh, requested and collected personal email addresses. And they were very clear, you know, look, this is not going to be spammed. This is very much for, you know, key employee uh, messaging. Um, but they've gathered sort of 95%. And very nice to sort of have those other ways of engaging with people or having... Um, their sort of uh, portal, remote portal for employees that's past the firewall. So it's not single sign on, um, which makes things a little bit more awkward for some people, like a couple of extra steps. But at the same time means that um, remoter workers can access it anywhere. So they don't have to uh, be restricted to a company account. So it's more accessible and more engaging as a result for people who are offline. Final speaker of the day was Leo Johnson. Um, I'd not come across him personally. He hosts a, uh, a Radio 4 show about future-proofing and he is uh, head of the PwC disruption team, so looking at future trends. And um, fantastic speaker, very easy to listen to, sort of, you know, a lovely mellow voice that you could just, uh, you know, wrap round do by a roaring fire and the hot chocolate um, and enjoy. Um, and then he used that, uh, that melodious voice for evil as he casts this terrifying dystopian vision of the future where technology can take us. And to be honest, after about uh, what felt like 20 minutes to half an hour, but it was probably more like 10 or 15, uh, I was ready to bow down uh, in submission to uh, my new robot overlords who were inevitably coming. So very much painting the picture of kind of the dangerous and genuinely quite frightening places that technology can take us. Fortunately, <laughs> he didn't leave us there, um, like wallowing in the gutter of despair as I was. Um, he said, look, that's where it, it can take us if there are no checks. And actually, harking right back to the beginning of Matthew Taylor, if we're asking how do we change to serve technology, if we let technology simply go wherever it wants to go um, and just make things as efficient as possible, putting the most people out of business, who's working, who's spending, who's creating, where are the communities? And instead he was saying that... To, um, what he's seeing is that technology and the ability to share knowledge is changing the ease of access to the means of production. So with 3D printers, microenergy production, online education, there is potential for a new economic model, which is almost kind of like this community ground up model that could replace the existing economic model. And that very much that Technology is not the solution. Again, it's not what's being done to us or it's, the, it's not the end goal, but it's an amplifier of intent so that people can get the most out of themselves. And <coughs> his final little thing, purpose eats strategy for breakfast. Um, organizations, again, they have to have that cause. If they're going to be relevant, people are gonna to wanna to see that purpose that cause and they want to know that the organization is driving to something and that it is not simply window dressing. And with a final little uh, very thing uh, quote that I uh, took in its whole, that really it's about working as if people and the planet mattered. And what a, a motto to carry with us when we look back at those half of people in poverty who are working as we think how do we become creative communities with a cause how do we support this planet um, that we live on how do we show our relevance to the world around us working as if people and the planet mattered i was going to talk a little bit about some of the suppliers i saw that sort of struck me but uh 
This has turned quite lengthy. Who knew summarising a whole day conference would take around 25 minutes? So I'll leave it there. Uh, I'll do another one uh, a bit later. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this with me. Uh, to be honest, if you've broken this down into bite-sized chunks, I thoroughly understand. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Cheerio and have a good day.